I believe it was like a cheerleader singing it. Like, or two, one or two cheerleaders. It's like the song played and like these two cheerleaders sang it. So it was like a, a live <laughs> version of the national anthem. When it started to play, we all, me, my team, and my coach, uh, all lined up on the baseline, and our back was to the the flag. It was on the wall closest to us, and when it started to play, it felt like I couldn't move, basically. Like, something inside of me really wouldn't let me move. And in my head, I was thinking like, well, you could just, you know, take two steps and you're like basically facing it just like everyone else. But it just kind of felt like I I couldn't. Do you, do you remember feeling self-conscious? Um, a little bit. I think I was just kind of worried. I knew that there was gonna be some type of negative reaction. I didn't know if it was going to be you know, more passive, like it would come in an email and then my athletic director would have a conversation with me or it would be more aggressive, I guess, like it was with people yelling and coming to my coach and stuff like that. So that was kind of like, do you think I'm gonna go this way or this way? And then kind of as I was thinking about that, I had to tell myself like, wait a minute, Tori, you have 100% the right to do this. like. You're doing what you want and you're doing it for a good reason and you shouldn't have to worry about getting in trouble. And even if you do get in trouble, well, you shouldn't (laughs) because this is what you can do and it's what you will do. This is American Descent, a podcast from With Good Reason and James Madison's Montpelier about pushing back in the pursuit of a better America. I'm Kelly Libby. Dissent gets a bad rap. It gets dismissed as troublemaking just for the sake of making trouble. But throughout American history, everyday people have recognized injustice and decided they had to do something about it. And in doing something, they've shaped a nation. The woman you just heard from? Her name is Tori Carter Johnston. I'll get back to her story in a bit. But first, I wanted to know some of the history behind the First Amendment to our Constitution, because that's the one that guarantees our right to exercise free speech, and also establishes a separation of church and state. So I want to take us back to 18th century Virginia, to a community of, at the time, marginalized people who were persecuted for their beliefs, and whose dissent had a profound effect on our lives today. These are devout evangelical Christians. It's important to remember that. We we tend not to associate evangelical Christians and separation of church and state today. These people are, are very passionate about their religion. This is John Ragosta, a historian at the International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, and author of a book called Wellspring of Liberty. And what John told me is that before the American Revolution, before our Constitution was drafted, There were these evangelical Christians, mostly Baptists and Presbyterians, who pushed for freedom of religion and separation of church and state at a time when most citizens were forced by the government to be Anglican. What were some of the worst of the persecutions? Uh, You know, they they would uh, take Baptists in particular out to the closest pond or river they could find, and they would dunk them in the river in parody of their immersion baptism and hold them underwater. In one case, they held somebody underwater until he almost drowned, and they'd pull him up and say, do you believe, do you believe? And they'd hold him underwater again. Uh, In other cases, they would throw rocks. In cases, they were shot at. Uh, One of these dissenting ministers had the foxhounds set on him. Uh, in one case, they throw a wasp nest, a hornet's nest, into a prayer meeting. In another case, history says they threw a snake into this prayer meeting. It's almost certainly a copperhead, a mean, venomous snake in this part of Virginia. But the Baptist in Virginia kept growing in number, and the Anglican establishment kept trying to put a stop to it. John says that by the time of the American Revolution, More than half of the Baptist ministers in Virginia had suffered jail time for preaching, but they used it to their advantage, to spread the gospel. 
they learned very quickly that being jailed was an opportunity for religious witness. And so if you're trying to convert people and tell people that you're a sincere Christian, the fact that you're in jail and you're still a believer is a powerful witness. So they would preach from their jail cell. And sometimes people would gather outside their jail cell to hear these people preach. Well, sometimes people would come through on horseback with horse whips and whip people listening to this preaching out of these jail cells. Uh, in some cases, they would simply sing obscene songs. In some cases, they are known to uh, the minister would be preaching from a jail cell partially below ground. Uh, they would be urinated on in their face as they're trying to preach. In one case, uh, Weatherford, a minister, Baptist minister, is preaching with his arms outstretched from from the windows of his jail cell and prayer, and they come up on his right and left with knives and cut his arms because he's preaching. But what happens, uh, one of the early politicians says it's almost like stepping on a bed of chamomile. And chamomile's famous, if you step on it, it just grows more and more and more. Uh, and they said the problem with persecuting these religious dissenters is the more we persecute them, the more we get. These are people who believe your central commitment is to God, and you have to have a personal relationship with God. And when you die, you're going to be in front of the judgment seat and you're going to be responsible to God and no one else for your behavior. And if government is somehow interfering in that behavior, it's really interfering with your religion. Uh huh. And so how was government interfering with that personal relationship with God. Um, we know that in Virginia, there is a religious tax to pay the Anglican minister and to make give the Anglican minister a home. So if you're Baptist or Presbyterian, Quaker, Lutheran, you are paying taxes to support the Anglican minister. But it went much beyond that. Um, you could be prosecuted and pay fines or even jailed for failing to attend church regularly. If you died and your children were orphaned, the Anglican Church decided who would care for those children. So if you were Baptist uh, and you died, your children would be placed in a good Anglican home. We don't want them raised Baptist. Um, so there are all of these things going on. You had to be married in the Anglican Church. If you're married by a Baptist minister without permission of an Anglican minister, your children are bastards. And that has legal consequences in 18th century Virginia. Uh, the other thing that was very significant was these dissenting groups uh, were more open to African Americans and to women. So you would occasionally see an African American minister as a Baptist because what made you a minister for, as a Baptist was if the Spirit moved you. So you could be an African American minister. You could even be an enslaved minister. You could be a woman and be a minister if the Spirit moved you. And so that's also challenging authority. Well, then the American Revolution starts, and suddenly overnight this all changes. Because if somewhere between one-fifth and one-third of the people in Virginia are dissenters, and you're going to war with the world's most powerful empire, the British Empire, you need these people. And so very early in 1775, 1776, we start to see these Anglican religious leaders and political leaders say, we have to get these people's support. Uh, we especially want the support of those Presbyterians from the Shenandoah Valley because they have rifles and they can hit a squirrel at 100 yards. We need these people. So if we need these people, how are we going to do it? Well, these dissenters started to write petitions to the uh, new independent legislature, the convention, and then the Virginia General Assembly, saying not that we want you to stop persecuting us, but we want religious freedom. By that, they meant they wanted an end to the religious tax and an end to Anglican marriages. They wanted their ministers to be exempted from military service, just like the Anglican ministers. And then these petitions would say, these things granted, or this being done, we will always support the state against tyrannical efforts of the British Empire. For years, the colonial legislature had ignored these petitions, asking for religious freedom. 
but the new independent Virginia legislature, they started granting it. So in 1776, the religious tax, that suddenly is suspended. In 1779, it's eliminated. We start to see dissenting ministers are exempted from military service in 1776, 1777. So all of these things start to change. We used to say that freedom-loving Americans were fighting against the British, and of course religious freedom was going to be part of that. But there's no of course. Uh, Religious freedom really was made part of the American Revolution by these evangelical dissenters saying, if you want us to fight, then you got to give us religious freedom. No more of this garbage where where we're being treated as second-class citizens. I want to take a break here for a quick refresher on the freedoms guaranteed in the First Amendment. There are five. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to assemble peaceably, and freedom to petition the government for a redress of grievances. But none of these freedoms were in the draft of the Constitution before it was ratified, before it was signed off on and made official. In fact, there was no First Amendment at all, and no Bill of Rights. Those came later, and they came in part because of the religious dissenters. See, James Madison, who would later become the fourth president of the United States, was at the time the leading advocate for getting a draft of the Constitution ratified in Virginia. But he almost wasn't a part of the ratification convention because he almost didn't get elected. And that's because of the Baptists and Presbyterians in his district, who were concerned that the Constitution didn't talk about religious freedom. And so the Baptists and the Presbyterians started talking among themselves, saying, well, maybe we shouldn't support Madison because he helped draft this constitution which doesn't talk about religious freedom. But then James Madison had a meeting that turned the tide. He met with a leading Baptist minister in Virginia named John Leland. Madison assures Leland that he is devoted to religious freedom, he is devoted to separation of church and state, and they will fix this. They will see to it that religious freedom is protected in the new United States. And Leland comes out and tells his Baptist congregants that, yes, let's support James Madison. Uh, Now, would James Madison have ever been elected? Would we have the U.S. Constitution? Would we have the Bill of Rights without these religious dissenters? Maybe not. I forget who said it, but somebody points out that in a totalitarian regime, in a dictatorship, in a monarchy, what we are worried about is the government hurting the rights of the majority. In a democracy, what Madison realizes, and he talks about this very expressly, is we have to protect the minority because the majority can make the laws, right? They can vote people into Congress. If you're white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, Christian, do you really need to have your religious freedom protected in 8th, 19th century, 20th century Virginia? No, what Madison says is the people who are gonna be persecuted are the dissenters, the Jews, the Muslims, the Hindus. And we see this all the time today. That's why we say black lives matter. Do white lives matter? Of course white lives matter, but that's never been an issue. We say black lives matter because those are the people likely to be facing problems with their civil rights. Um, You know, Kaepernick or anyone else who, who wants to take a knee, they're exercising their First Amendment freedom of speech rights. Jefferson and Madison and these evangelical religious people in the 18th century understood that we needed those rights to protect people doing something we don't like. You know, you, we don't need freedom of speech to protect people when they say things we like. You don't need freedom of speech to protect Star Wars movies that people want to go to anyway. You need freedom of speech, you need freedom of religion, uh, you need freedom of assembly to protect th- those people who we don't necessarily like. Which brings us back to Tori Carter Johnston. Um, I identify as female. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a biracial woman. Tori's a recent graduate from a high school in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, is it is it okay? Yep. I'm talking. Okay. 
Um, so I guess could you start with like what had been happening at school, like what you had been learning about? <clears throat> um, at school, I think there was a lot. There was definitely a lot of talk about the whole Colin Kaepernick situation because it was very new at the time. Um, and it was just at the beginning of it. So it was still like kind of it was more controversial. People were kind of figuring out how they felt about it. Overnight, San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick refusing to stand during the national anthem again. The 49ers quarterback refusing to stand for the national anthems of four games. Fans protesting uh, his jersey. They're burning it. You Once see some again, of that right there. We have cops that are murdering people. We have cops in the SFPD that are blatantly racist. And those issues need to be. And this is also at the kind of the peak of this whole police brutality thing. This country this weekend, hundreds were arrested in ongoing protests over police shootings of black citizens. Largely peaceful protests black 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 in several cities, including St. Minnesota. Tori told me her school holds a speaker series. And every Friday, they invite someone from the community, a parent, an alum, to share something with the whole school. And um, I think a woman came in and just basically talked to us about our rights, what qualifies as free speech, stuff like that. Um, and then the Colin Kaepernick thing came up and it was like, who's to say that what he's doing is wrong because he's, you know, using his free speech um, and that's just what got me thinking about it. I mean, I've already, I'd already been thinking about it, but it got me thinking about actually doing it. And then later that day, I just happened to have a volleyball game. And that's where she made the decision to protest. Tori says when the national anthem started and everyone in the gym turned to face the flag, she kept her feet planted. The first pushback came during the game. Um, I heard some yells from the stands of, of I guess, a, a, a parent or just somebody watching. And uh, they said, my number was number 10, and they would say things like, get 10 off the court, like, she shouldn't be playing, stuff like that, get out the gym, things of that nature. Um, and I got a lot of <laughs> ugly stares, especially when I came close to the side of the uh, of the benches where the crowd was. And then after the game, uh, I guess the guy who was yelling or did most of the yelling during the game went over to my coach and I could kind of hear him saying like, you need to kick her off the team, like she shouldn't be playing, stuff like that. After the game, Tori says, the athletic director of the other team called her school's athletic director and said that if a protest happened again, their team would forfeit. That sparked a conference of all the athletic directors in the league. It definitely was a little weird to think about that, like this whole conference of a you know, bunch of like 30, 40 year old men just like sitting around the ta a table uh, talking about me and like you know, what I had done and because of what I had done, what the league is going to do in the future. Ultimately, Tori's team had to make some compromises. So for instance, some teams would play Tori's team as long as her team left the gym during the national anthem. And it kind of felt like it was getting to a point where people were trying to say, even if they weren't saying it directly, or they would, they're kind of basically being like, why don't you just give up? Or like, why don't you just take what you got and just go with it? You already made your statement, stuff like that. But something else happened as a result of Tori's protest. Her school held an inaugural Summit on Diversity and invited other schools in the area to attend, including the schools in her league. I think it, if it, even if it's not a huge ripple effect, there was little waves <laughs> over everywhere. <laughs> yeah. When Tori's decision to protest police brutality was met with roadblocks, she says she felt frustrated and even angry at times. But at the end of the day, we're talking about it, and I'm talking about how I feel, and they're talking about how they feel. And even if we're probably not going to come to a 100% agreement, but at least in their mind, they're going to remember this time in their life when you know, they had to talk about this girl who's doing her 
activism at your school and like this is how she felt about it. I don't know, it, it also felt a little personal at times cause like people will hate me for how I look. And I'm, I'm a mixed race person and people will hate that about me. So for me, it was just kind of like, I understand that you feel frustrated about this, but there are people in this world who are literally dying because people hate them so much for basically no reason. So if you're offended by my demonstration, I'm sorry, but I'm still gonna do it. American Descent is a production of James Madison's Montpelier and with good reason at Virginia Humanities. Our artwork is by Carson McNamara and our music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. 